All right, everyone. Hello. Welcome back to another episode. Not a new season, but, you know, just kind of like a a new year of of real talk, you could say. I mean, it's 2021 now. We are done. The apocalypse didn't happen. Uh, We are back. Can you believe it? Because I can't. Like, we're still here somehow. That is nuts. I mean, and, but what, I mean, what better time to be watching new things every day than not only during a pandemic, but during Christmas break. And that is definitely what, that's what you did. I I can't, I keep pointing in the wrong direction. But Uh what we're going to do this week is we're going to talk about, just like our first show of the new season, we're going to do our top three last. We're talking about things we sort of like took in during the break, Mm -hmm. as well as you all know about our mutual obsession, uh, Euphoria, because it dropped a new special. And uh, I fucking mm-hmm. died last time, so I was like, okay, we have to talk about this before, mm-hmm. like, side on scene before either of us had, either of us had even watched it. It's like, I have to put it in the schedule. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For and sure. I waited until last night to watch it. Really? Oh. Oh my god. Oh my god. I was underwhelmed, but oh, it's really? not bad. Well, I think we can. Do you want to touch on it first, or do you want? I, I, to... I said, let's get to it first. I feel like it'd be shorter. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we, I mean, we, we can talk about Rue and Jules's episode as well, if we would like, just because there I mean, were. Rue is a lot, man. I don't want, one. it's, I, I, okay, here's my thing. I saw someone on Letterboxd say this, so I don't feel bad being hyperbolic about it. Okay. I feel like, um, oh, I'm, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the title of the episode that way. I'm not like totally. Uh, fuck everyone who's not a blobfish. No, no, no. Before, uh, Rue's episode. Oh, it's um, hard times don't last always. Trouble don't last always. That's right. Yeah. That is one of the my greatest fucking pieces of cinema I have mm-hmm. ever seen. Oh, it's fantastic. Like, it shook me to my fucking core. It is heartbreaking. It's emotional. Thank you. Sam Levinson. <laughs> if Malcolm and Marie falls apart, I'm coming for you. Because that's that fairly okay. soon, isn't it? Malcolm and Marie's coming out it's like literally next this week? Friday. It's our next, oh. it's our next episode. Spoiler oh, alert. Me. Oh wow. We're gonna die. Oh, we're gonna die. That's gonna but, be good. Like I I I didn't know how he was gonna do it. Like he still made something great. I, I still think uh, Jules's episode is brilliant, mm-hmm. but it's hard when you have to live up to that. That's understandable. I related more to Jules's episode mm-hmm. um, because there's a, there's a, there's a sequence of it um, in which she's talking about like, you know, every time I left her alone, I felt guilty because I was worried that, you know, like if I, I would come back and I would find her dead or she would do something irrational. Like, and I, that hit way too close to home to the point where I was like, oh, holy shit. Like I have this newfound respect for Jules because I think that she is, you know, not only a child of divorce, I think her father seems fairly still connected with her mother, but I know that they are not together well, it's but also but not a child of divorce, like a child of a separation because well, they've been apart for a while. Because... Separation, right. But not only that, but she's the child of an alcoholic, which yeah. I know that they kind of, they, I, I'm rewatching Euphoria with a friend right now. And I, we just got done with Jules's um, episode, which is also the carnival episode, which is mm, work of art. Perfect. And Perfection. Amazing. It's so good, right. But you know, they, and so they touched upon Jules's mother so briefly that I was kind of like, I'm unsure of what Jules's mom's problem was. I didn't know if it was depression. I didn't know if it was drug addiction or what have you, but to find out that it was, you know, alcohol abuse, things like that, to find out that her mother would go missing from, for days on end, like think th- little things like that, just kind of, I didn't realize that I would relate to so much to say the least, even though I'm saying the most. So I I appreciated the episode because it made me feel less alone, I guess, as a child similar to Jules. I'm not a child anymore, but the point is, you know, I I, yeah. I appreciated Jules's episode as well as the scene where she's kind of having that back and forth with with um fake Tyler, shy guy 118, the, the uh, fake Jesus. person who talked to you for so long, uh, and as well as watching rules like oh my god, rules. Watch I feel like I've done that before on this show. Watching Ju- or Rue go into the bathroom to, you know, clearly shoot up something, just something, you know, it that was I think was amazing. I, I think I think uh, what happened here is that Sam Levinson, Sam, if I may, uh, Mr. Levinson, <laughs> he, <laughs> he 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 shot very tight and controlled with the first episode just to tell a strong story. Mm-hmm. Like the, the first, first episode was all about the writing 
right. which was all about the direction. Yeah. And like he 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 took especially in that sequence transitioning from being locked in the bathroom to everything with Tyler and even a little mm -hmm. bit after. Just trying oh. to capture everything Jules feels in a Jules way, mm -hmm. in non-literal, metaphorical, just colors and movements and just emotion. Right. And I think that's just sort of where it lost me. Cause like as, mm -hmm. as a viewer, I prefer acting over direction and I prefer like oh. a more solid story. And See, like, I, yeah, I, I think, I think both characters, especially these episodes mm -hmm. come down to like their own versions of self-destructiveness. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think, I feel like maybe just, I connected to Ruse a lot more because her whole thing is just like, I will go out of my way to destroy anything that makes me happy. Whereas Jules is, is just like, at the mind, at the smallest inconvenience, just world shattering and just impossible to process and takes mm -hmm. everything too far. Although I will say, yeah, coming as someone who's like under the trans umbrella, yeah, opening the episodes like I want to get off hormones. <sighs> Hard it, that that set a thing for me. I just because trying to process that and then her explanation for it, mm -hmm. like I understand it and I respect that. Just I was too. I think I was just so self obsessed with that. Mm -hmm. I'm just like. How does that work? And this idea of like, mm -hmm. again, like I find myself as non-binary, at least just away from manliness because I oh. hate what everything masculinity stands for. Right. And that's sort of what Jules is doing. Mm -hmm. But then that's why she wants to be less feminine mm. because she created herself in the mm -hmm. eyes of a man. Exactly. And I think that's a fascinating thing to get into. That, and I think it's like a wonderful conversation to have. Oh, yeah. But just hearing that, just like, set off the wires in my brain the wrong way. And I had a hard time like bringing me back into the episode that it wasn't until like after that weird, not like metaphorical sequence that right. I, I actually end up emotionally being in the headspace to get into the scene again. Right. I think this was a pivotal moment within the episode when Jules is kind of saying like, oh geez. And you, and you, you, you briefly, you, you, you said it, you just, uh, not in, not how she said it. And I'm not going to say it how she said it either. Cause I forgot, but she said, she said she wanted to conquer femininity, but femininity ended up conquering her. And I think that's what, I believe that's what the quote was. Um, but it just, it, it really, geez, I didn't, um, what, what, could I, what, what was I going to say? I think her her perspective on th I I enjoyed seeing her perspective on things. I I also appreciate that they did something fairly similar to Rue's episode without making it the exact same because yeah. what I saw them doing at first was okay, Rue's episode takes place in a diner. She is talking with Ollie. And then I saw I I, I saw the beginning of Jules's episode um, and I saw kind of the the direction in which Jules's episode was taking, and I'm like, oh, okay, this is just going going to be Jules sitting and talking with her therapist, um, which is I mean that would have been just fine. But I also do appreciate that they kind of switched it up a little bit um, with the scene with her and Tyler, and the scene with her and uh, Rue and whatnot, and and the kind of I and and and, and that's where. That's where I think we're very, we're not different, but at the same time, we look at different things and we appreciate different things within film. Um, and I appreciated the scene with her and um, and Tyler, that kind of like insane, dramatic, chaotic, di uh, direct, directorial, directorial, geez, yeah. directorial, like madness of, you know, that entire scene. Um, because I, I, I think I, I, I appreciate the eye of the director a lot. I, I, as a writer, I appreciate, uh, acting and I appreciate writing for a series, but I'm also a very visual person. Like, I feel like the differences in the episode came from how both characters process trauma Yeah. because Ruse is all about her, like early in the series, we talked about how like she had codependency with everyone else, mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. she relied on, on other people to just get her through life. And that was sort of how her and Jules sort of got together. Mm -hmm. And then that's how her and I'm forgetting the character's name, but Coleman Domingo. And that's sort of what he was Ali? in that sequence. Hmm? Ali? Yes, Ali. How even though that she, she knew all of this, she couldn't quite express it until someone was there with her. And mm -hmm. even though like Jules is in therapy, Mm -hmm. She's very much a singular character. Again, this idea of the, of the singular self-destruction. Mm. Like everything around her impacts her, and she handles it as, as an individual. And, this, and that could be a thing of just, like, from a, a family of separation, of just, like, yeah. lack of trust or connection with 
parents just mm -hmm. on her own, which is why when she's in therapy, a lot of her things are just long monologues about how mm -hmm. she's feeling in these own self revelations that aren't really pushed by her therapist. It's hard not to compare that to. And mm -hmm. I think Trouble Don't Last Always is one of the finest episodes of TV ever. This is still amazing. Oh, yeah. It's like, uh, it's, it's, it's like the car movie. It's like, this is brilliant, but I like this. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, all I can say is that I am so stoked to see what happens in season two. I think I may be a little jaded right now, though, because for the most part, I'm, I'm kind of feeling like I just want, I don't, I don't, as much as I care about some of the other characters, I really would just love a show where it's just Rue and Jules. I know that probably wouldn't work. Um, and I do miss Kat. I want to see what she's up to. So this series of films originally started in the 80s. It had a, a, a film in the, it, the film in 19, like the late 1980s, and then one kind of in the early 90s. Um, but then they came back with a, not a reboot, but a, the third, I feel like, do you not know what this is? I'm, 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 I, keep, I can't keep track of it. I'm really just like. <laughs> so the, the film series that I kind of binged um, really quick through um, winter break was um, the Bill and Ted series. <gasps> yeah. 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 <laughs> so I, I had seen the first two. I had seen Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I had seen Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey long ago. Cause you know, we have parents that were alive in the eighties and they show My us. My parents things. hate those movies. I love both of them. I, I, actually, no, I love Excellent Adventure. I hate Bogus Journey. <laughs> you hate Bogus Journey? I really liked yeah. Bogus Journey. It's just boring. I don't no, get it. No. Like, they go to hell. Are you kidding me? That's cool. They go to hell in the, in the third one. <laughs> I know, but it's not as weird. Anyways. Um, but yes, so I had I had seen these before. I I enjoyed them. I didn't, I was very indifferent as a child, but kind of I I fell in love with not just one, but two of the actors um in these films. One being the very, very obvious choice of Keanu Reeves. Who doesn't love Keanu? I feel like that, I mean. I just think he's a very like. Do you like Keanu? Wait, did you say you didn't like Keanu? We stand. Oh, of course, of course, we stand Keanu. But he's like the obvious choice, right? I obviously love Alex Winter as Bill, of uh, as well. However, Bill and Ted Face the Music <sighs> brought me Bridget Lundy pain, and oh, oh my god, oh my they god, <laughs> oh my god, I. I cannot, and they're they're my background on my phone right now. It's really just, I'm spiraling. I I think it's fun. I think it. I I have a big love for the '80s and things that come from the '80s, and so it was really fun to get to go back and see um, the movies that I had really enjoyed. Um, and then also, it was fun to get to see the new Bill and Ted because they're you know, they're old and they're different now, but they're still the same Bill and Ted that we know from the classic 80s films alongside their amazing and very obviously in love children. Um, so I really appreciated that point of it. Um, but yeah, like, and it also kind of like, it was, it was a nice way to spend a week, you know, of time where I could just kind of sit back and relax and watch a Bill and Ted over again. So I would, I mean, I if you, if you enjoy 80s movies, kind of quirky, you know, fun '80s movies. Then you haven't seen Bill and Ted. Then I mean, go for it. I think they're they're both on Amazon Prime, which is which was uh, is always nice. Um, but yeah, I I don't know. There's not much else to say about it. I also like rock music, and that's just an added plus yeah. that you get when you when you watch Bill and Ted. So that was one of the first kind of things that I've binged um, at the beginning of uh, the winter the winter break season. But yeah, it was a good time. Give me your series because I'm excited. Uh, okay, so um, back in like last spring, I, I, I started this a little bit with like, I rewatched uh, the original The Muppets mm -hmm. in 2011. Love it. I'm like, Jason Siegel, oh my God. He's going to be a trend on this. Man or Muppet, one of the greatest songs so of good. all time. I, see, see, we built the, the, we built this city montage really did it for me. But. And <laughs> so something, something that was, something in it was just like, wasn't sitting right. I was like, hmm. Hmm. Back to that. I really love this. So then I was like, hmm, let me watch Muppets Most Wanted. Of course. Oh. Everyone's like, everyone's like mix, mixed on it. Mixed. I thought it was awesome. <laughs> I was huge on it. Everyone talked to me was like, it's not that great. And I thought to myself, everyone else didn't like it. Right. And I really liked it. Right. What if I just really liked the Muppets? 
So then I sat down and I watched the ABC Muppet series, which I'm still working my way through. Oh, the, so the, the one that's like The Office, right? Yeah. And I'm hooked. So, so then uh, pretty much back to back, I watched the original Muppet movie from like 1979. And then Great Muppet Caper, which fucking oh, rocks. So fucking good. And that, get, and that gets us up to now, where sometime relatively soon, I'm going to be watching Muppet Treasure Island and uh, Muppet Christmas Carol. Muppet and Treasure I'm so Island. Excited. Treasure so Island. excited. So excited. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Muppets in Space. Please tell me that's on your list. I have nowhere to watch it. <laughs> it, it it's, it's not on Disney+. Plus. It's not. So Disney Plus is actually so. OK, so I follow the Muppets account on Twitter. Obviously, I am a avid Muppet fan, which is why I'm so happy that you are bringing this up. I love everything and all things Jim Henson, Fraggle Rock, the fucking Emmett Otter's junk band Christmas. You can give me everything, Jim Henson, and I will take it. Um, so I follow the Muppets account on Twitter and they are doing like a huge kind of like push of Muppets content that will be going up on Disney plus very soon. So we will get to see the original seventies Muppet show yes. on, on yes. Disney plus yes. February 19th, which literally I used to watch the show religiously. My mom had the box set because I get my love from my Muppet, for, <laughs> I get my love of the Muppets from my mother. So I used to have the Muppet box set and I, I was freaking out whenever Disney Plus came out because I'm like, oh shit, we're going to get some Henson up in this bitch. And then when the Muppet Show was not on there, I had a bit of a breakdown, but it's okay. We're going to be fine. <laughs> the Muppets are coming to Disney Plus. We will be good. I can watch the Mark Hamill episode of The Muppets and it'll be great. <laughs> this is a show um, starring, um, oh my goodness, let me, I, 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 like, I, I think I was from, isn't it one of like the, one of the fucking actors from it or whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jack Dylan Grazer. So this yeah. show stars Jack Dylan Grazer and then Jordan Christine Sim Simone, I believe is how you pronounce their name. Um, and this show is called We Are Who We Are. Um, this show is about a family, um, two the two, two moms who one is a uh, army, like army commander, and the other one is a um, army medic. And they come to live at an army base in Italy. Um, of course, we you, you, you got to keep the theme of in Italy when you are working with the director, with the director Luca Giar, Guard, Guard. Oh my goodness, Guard, Luca Guadagnino. Guard, say that one more time. Guadagnino. Guadagnino. I would have never gotten that phonetically. <laughs> Luca Guadagnino. Guadagnino is. Guadagnino. Exactly. So uh, he is an Italian man. And the majority of um, the production team for this show was uh, were made up of people from Italy, which is really cool. Um, and it but it, it what made it interesting to me was that this show was about a group of Americans who live like I mean, like I said, they live in an army base in Italy. Um, and it's kind of it, it was very the first episode to me was really jarring because you kind of deal with Jack Dylan Grazer's character whose name, oh, whose name is, oh my goodness, oh, Frazier. Um, I'm right, no, I know. It, it, he, and he's he, he lives up to the name. He is this very eccentric, very, he's obsessed with like high fashion and wants to be a fashion designer. And he just thinks he is so much better than everyone else, but in a very like closed off way. Um, and he, he like has a drinking problem as a 14 year old, like 15 minutes into the episode, the first episode, the show is just, it's, it's interesting. Is, is this just call me by your name without pedophilia? I got to know that right off the bat. Unfortunately, the pedophilia is still there. So, um, you know, I thought I had escaped it and let me, let me, I guess I can touch on that really quickly. So I thought I had escaped it for some reason I didn't because you have, you have the character of Frasier, Frasier, the the it boy, the little it boy with a cast. I never saw it. I don't know the character's name. Point is, you have him coming in and kind of shaking this this very closed off and very tight knit community of Americans living in the middle of Italy, uh, or on the coast of Italy, might I say. Um, but he comes he comes in with his family, and everyone's kind of taken aback because it's like, oh, here's this very flamboyant and free to be himself kid with his, you know, two lesbian mothers coming in to our very American, you know, very proud to be an American army base. Um, and not only that, but it takes place during the 2016 election. So you get to see this kind of like, 
not this shift, but you get to see that from the perspective of Americans who do not live in America, which was very interesting because you have um, the characters of, oh my goodness, you have the characters of Caitlin and her father, Richard, who Caitlin is played by Jordan Christine Simone, um, and Richard, her father, is played by Kid Cudi. Um, and Kid Cudi back on your list twice. <laughs> I know, right? You the character of Kid Cudi. And it's this interesting kind of like disconnect that you see between these people who are living so far away from the country that they are protecting. Um, and because it takes place in the 2016 election, you have that underlying um, kind of motif of Donald Trump, unfortunately. But what's interesting to me is that these people were raised in America. Like the, the you know, like it's, it's Kid Cudi and his daughter. And in the second episode, when you get to know them better, they buy MAGA hats, like in the mail. And they put them on and they smile in front of a mirror and it's truly haunting. And it's this kind, but it's, it's, it's again, like these people who have, despite, you know, being so connected morally, morally, I wouldn't say being connected with their country are more or less kind of oblivious to what's happening there because they're so far away and they're in another country. Um, and so but that's the, the that that being said that is not the that is not the premise of the story the premise is um uh, Caitlin and Fraser the two children who live next door to each other on the army base meeting and becoming best friends and just kind of what becomes of it uh, it's a story just about about um about gender discovery it's a story about self discovery um and it also has a um, cameo from one of my very favorite musical artists, Blood Orange. Um, but yeah, no, this show is is definitely a good escape if that is what you are looking for. Um, and it is very quick too. It's about eight episodes, and they're you know forty five to fifty minutes long. Um, it is it is a show as opposed to a film. Um, and I am unsure if they're coming back for a season two. It's it felt very final and very finished whenever I finished it. Um, and I also don't know if it really requires a season two. I, well, I'd love I, to see I, I went to my caveat and the only reason I know about it is because I see it on Letterboxd. My friends love it. So good. generally what Letterboxd does, I think is what they only do shows that have one thing like singular seasons. Right. Which is why Euphoria doesn't have, but they're like individual like episode specials are on there right. or why uh, Little Lies is on there because I didn't think they get a season two and then they did. Mm. So that that would just be my guess. It's like as a mini series, I've heard great things. Well, it, it and it and it's one of those shows that it 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 doesn't it it does not require a season two, um, because where it leaves off is it's it's not very it's not very up in the air. You kind of you kind of understand like there's probably you know obviously things will happen after to these characters, but the, it's probably not very necessary to continue with the story. Um, because one of the, you know, big catalysts within the story may not be there if a second season occurs. So, you know, I think that it is definitely not something that requires a second season, but it is, I wouldn't say no to it if it occurred. Um, but I, yeah, no, I recommend it very heavily, much like Call Me By Your Name. It is very picturesque. It is beautiful, especially the first uh, episode, which is, I think, by far my favorite of the series. Um, so yeah, that is on HBO Max, if you want to watch it. It's called We Are Who We Are. So, my movie yes. is a documentary Ooh. about a bunch of 17 and 18 year old white boys in Texas mm. who want to be politicians and they're all fucking psychopaths. Mm. Except for two, and those two are really fucking cool kids. It's called Boys States. I've heard a lot about this. And I, I, I will say this in that the actual pitch for like where, the, so Boys State is one half of this like political camp that a bunch of Texas kids can go to once a year to learn how to be politicians. They live in their own like little microclimate of a government and have to run for different government positions mm -hmm. and you follow basically four kids who are on opposing campaigns in different parties so they have the um the nationalists and the federalists ah. and 
you follow basically the, the, the two primary candidates on each side, I think. Um, the, the, the size doesn't matter really, but <laughs> it's just it's just sort of about how we breed uh, politics into our children mm -hmm. and how like this is basically the future of our country. And okay. I really don't, I don't like documentaries. They, they have a hard time like sinking me in. Mm -hmm. But this did what I think most 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 docu most great documentaries do well, namely my actual favorite documentary, uh, Jesus Camp, in that oh, you just I love Jesus Camp. You you photograph the subject and don't mm -hmm. try to have an influence on what's happening. You allow the viewer to like develop your own narrative from it, and this all sort of culminates in the final election where the Nationalists and Federalists have had their elected governors. And they are now running against each other. I, I I love that kind of like the just filming what you what you see and not trying to you know mess with anything within it um, because of course that gives you something that's not entirely realistic. Um, it's just fascinating. Know, but oh my god! I you know, it's I, the entire movie again. It's not about the journey. It's just about seeing how these kids react to politics. Right. And how this is our generation. These kids are barely younger than us. Yeah. This is the future of our of our nation. And looking at and I think I think the thing to point out, and I think is the important idea of coming into the series how to know how the children are. For a couple of years now, the the main fighting point for a stance for all candidates is Texas seceding. Because they think it's one big fucking joke. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what the the film first sort of pit, like stands us against is do children of our of our generation see politics as a joke and do they put any weight in it? Ooh. And then you contrast it with Stephen and Renee, who are amazing people. And Stephen actually spoke at the DNC oh, for wow. hip, for um for Biden recently, I think. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, no, he's great kid, great fucking kid. I'm really happy to see him going places. I mm. highly recommend it. It's one of my favorites of the year. It's it's really just, I think it's interesting that this film also brings up that idea of, you know, what do, what do, what do children know about politics? Yeah. What do oh. underage children know about politics? Some of them know a lot, like a yeah. lot, a lot. Others, absolutely nothing. And that's terrifying. Especially uh, these people who are like, again, they are here because they plan to run the country. A mm -hmm. majority of, of like Southern Republican candidates, sorry, Southern, Southern Republican presidents yeah. come from there. They have yeah. actual pictures of um, both Bushes, Reagan, mm -hmm. and even a couple more going back. Mm -hmm. Like there, like here is our legacy. Like this camp cultivates presidents and they, they need to approach the situations with seriousness. Yeah, I will say, however, one of my favorite things is um, I won't say where, but one of the guys running for it, me and my friend called him Aaron Burr <laughs> because his, his, literally his, his his thing is like, I don't have a stance. I want you to decide my stance. Oh, he, he, and, he, and he's a major candidate in the race, which I think is fucking hilarious because like, oh, wow, you know Aaron Burr, you know how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Well, that I mean, I cannot be more excited to watch this. I'm really considering. Hopping on this train. You should. Is it gonna, make, is it gonna keep me up at night or am I gonna it's like, it's like an hour forty five? The most it'll do yeah. is like scare you about children, but you, more, you know more that. So keep me up at night with my thoughts or growing up in a growing up in a deep red county, nothing there will surprise you. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll probably be good. What, okay, so what is your final pick? All right. My final pick, um, like I've said, I just finished this today. This was a this is a series, this is a television show, um that unlike who we are, who we are, um, should have gotten 16 seasons, maybe, okay, maybe not, maybe like eight, but it still should have ran for longer than it did. Um, but unfortunately it only got one. Um, and it was, it was on Netflix for a while back, um, around the time I was in high school and I started it then and never finished it. But I had a friend come to me and say, like, I'm watching this. I think you really need to see it. Uh, and so I did. I am talking about freaks and geeks. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I I just finished this very recently, maybe just about a few hours ago. And I it so my one my 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 resentment to start it again after 
starting it in high school and never finishing it was that I was upset that it only got one season. I really, really liked it when I started it. And I didn't want to have to go through like the stages of grief with not being able to have more seasons of this show. And after finishing it, I still feel really like, oh, that fucking sucks. Like I really liked this. I wish it had a season two, but I'm definitely glad that I watched it. Um, I I don't know. Like I I think that one thing that really gives this show the the sparkle that it has is the cast. I think the cast is one of the absolute best parts of the show. You have Linda Cardellini as Lindsay, the main character. Uh, John John Francis Daly, who was big on Bones. James Franco is in this show. You have Seth Rogen, Jason Segel, uh, Martin Starr, who I know and love as Mr. Harrington in the Spider-Man oh, movie. So that, now, now that you've seen that, you have to watch the Muppets again to get more Jason Segel. I know, no, dude, I love, and, and I, listen, I love Jason Segel so fucking much. I love, I love you, man. I love the Muppets. I love how Getting I met your mother. I, oh, how I met your mother, oh, sweet Marshall. But, but forgetting Sarah Marshall. Forgetting but, Sarah, I thought you meant Marshall and how I met your mother. No, 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 no. Just, I, it's, I always gotta point out, cause like, I, 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 I talked about it on a show where it's like, you know why this movie is important? Because it broke the stereotype of male nudity on on film. <laughs> and it just, I, and and I mean, the show really. My biggest takeaway from Freaks and Geeks is that literally everyone fucks up. Everyone fucks up all the time too. Everyone fucks up all the time, and that's just life. No character in this show, despite except for one, except for one character, um, and I'll get to that. No character in this show is perfect. Jason Siegel's character is 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 kind of he he manipulates stories and he's kind of selfish um but he also is just very compassionate and very loving and it's sad because he and the other main character Lindsay who is also very flawed, you know, have this very brief relationship and you can tell that they really appreciate each other as characters but they just weren't together at the right place and time, but you can tell at the end of the of the season that they both really still kind of have feelings for each other, but we never get to we never get to resolve that. Um, you know, Lindsay, the main character played by Linda Cardellini, who is Velma in the live action Scooby Doo movies, and Shutney in Legally Blonde. No, she's literally and she's and she's I mean just precious in this show, but she's also like very you know, she, she, she doesn't make good decisions all the time, even though she's literally a straight A student, she's, you know, a a very kind and compassionate person. She fucks up. Dave Franco's character obviously fucks up. Uh, Seth Rogen, she, he's, he's in it, but he's also like, he doesn't do much to fuck up. You can tell that at the end of the season there, they wanted to bring him, bring him in more and he, they have him fuck up a little bit, but for the most part, he's a good guy. Um, the only character I will tell you right now that does not fuck up is Bill played by Martin Starr, um, who is one of my favorite actors of all time. If you like it's Silicon Valley. Guy is the best one. Well, no, 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 I know, but, but, okay, but he is, that's the thing. He <laughs> actually is. He does nothing wrong. There is nothing he does that is incorrect. He literally just kind of wants to exist as a person and he's fine with that. And he's also the funniest one too. Like everything about this show is, is very nice and wholesome. Um, it, one of the executive producers is Judd Apatow and you can tell by the casting um, that man is latched on to his, his actors and never let go. Um, but you know, like it's, it's just a very, it's a nice and easy, it's a very easy show to watch if you are bored and in need of something to watch. Um, and even though there's only one season, it's 18 episodes. Um, and so that's a lot. It's 18 episodes that are like 45 minutes each. And so I I think that if you're looking for anything to binge at the moment, uh, they just put it on Hulu after taking it off of Netflix. And it has never been a better time to watch the show. Um, so yeah, Freaks and Geeks just... Very, very good. Very deserving of a season two. It's literally been 21 years though, so I doubt we'll even get a reboot because they already did a reunion in 2007. So like, we're kind of the ship has sailed. However, it's just it's 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 refreshing, even though it's old. I, I want to build up to this. Oh, so okay. it stars a gay icon. Okay, someone who's appeared in a Spider-Man movie. The newer middle and the Spider Man, Andrew Garfield. It's a comedy. 
released in 2015 about some high schoolers who uh, you think they're nerds, but they're actually drug dealers. It's called Dope. Dope! Tony Rivalori! Yes! The best Flash Thompson. I'm, the only good Flash Thompson. He's a very good Flash Thompson. I love him as Flash. I, so for those who don't know, uh, I run a competitive movie trivia league on YouTube. There are uh, Spider-Men in this movie. Who's the other one? Is it? No, you keep talking, but I'm going to make sure about this. I'm, 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 Sh Shameik Moore is the star, which is what I'm saying. Was Shameik not Miles Moore? He is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. T two Spider-Men. Actors. I would, okay. Yeah. 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 Tony wasn't so, but he could be. And um, for a match that we're taping tomorrow, I needed to watch Dope, as well as for a match I'm taping, uh, I think, like, Thursday next. That's not the point. Okay, like, here's the time I'll sit down and watch it. I was floored. It is you so seen much fun. Never. I, I knew oh, nothing about this other than, like, the kids like 90s movies. Oh, oh. All right. So for those of you who don't know, I'll try to keep the plot semi-vague, but it's basically just there's some, there's some high schoolers. They're real fucking nerds. Uh, and then one, they, they get caught up in a drug deal and the movie is mostly about them sort of figuring out like, Hey, we got drugs. What do we do? What are we going to do with that? And I, I came into this, like, I want 90s references. I want ready player one, but good. And as it went on, it's like, wait, no, actually, like, I actually really enjoy the crime element. Yeah. Like I, I thought that'd just be like tearing. It's like, no, I am fully invested. And it it is it is an inherently modern movie. It is mm -hmm. not timeless whatsoever. And that's what I fucking love about it. Mm -hmm. It uses everything about the 2010s and the exact time period that it came out to tell its story. Yeah. And I feel like that is just so refreshing. Because I feel like a lot of movies nowadays either don't really give a shit about it or they use it the wrong way. This just understands how important technology is to our generation and utilizing it perfectly. Mm-hmm. Or um, I, I, I learned this in a screenwriting class a while ago mm -hmm. about like, there are certain things you need to do, especially in crime films, yeah. about how to avoid technology. Cause like, hey, police, movie's over. Hey, Mr. Police. Yeah, yeah. get over <laughs> But this movie uses, uses, the, uses, the, uses the technology to its advantage and it's fucking great. And all the characters are wonderful. And yes, of course, my favorite one is the gay one because as always, uh, Kirstie <laughs> Clemens, is <laughs> such a good actress. Uh -huh. She's amazing. Oh, <laughs> and then Tony Lori, of course, we stand amazing. Mm -hmm. I am like six degrees separation, like connected to him somehow, and I really hope I get to meet him someday. But Shamik Moore, he's so fucking good, and I love his haircut so much. Right, he's he, he looks like he's out of the fucking top heads. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that is I honestly. This isn't a movie that really gets lost on people easily. I think once you see it and once you know it exists, it like very much sticks with you. Um, that isn't to say that I forgot that it existed, but I think I just kind of, it, it I got lost a little bit and I just, I, I was on your letterbox like seconds ago and I was like, oh my gosh, wait, wait, wait. Adelaide just watched Dope. I need to watch Dope again. <laughs> I need to watch Dope. I I forget. Did you did you have it on your on your 2010s list? I did not. No. Okay. It's it's something that I feel like if we did like 2010s comedies, it could definitely get oh, in there. For sure. And something like the fact that it's that it struck me that much on the first viewing, like I feel like it can only really go up. I ignore mm -hmm. this. I'm just you're good. feeling something right now. <laughs> but also, hey, welcome welcome to video. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, um, now you can see what we look like, even though yeah. I don't know. Maybe you maybe you knew already. <laughs> yeah. I, if, if you didn't know what we look like, thank you for watching our show because you probably yeah. don't know you. Yeah, no, we probably, I mean, we may not. That, that's yeah. the thing. Either that or you're a Pacific student and maybe we've seen you around or you're new. Yeah. We haven't seen you at all. Well, anyways, uh, Dope's fantastic. I don't know where you can watch it. I watched it on fucking Voodoo because my friend paid for it and I just mm -hmm. stole his account. It's probably somewhere. I, it's, I, I think I checked it. Like, everywhere is like you have to pay for it, unfortunately. Really? Oh, yeah. But, the only thing, yeah, huh. Yeah. Not if, easily accessible at the moment, but you know. If you like Spider Man and the gays, I highly recommend it. It's fantastic. <laughs> That's uh, just it's just me. Yeah. Well, um <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you just described me. Oh, that's I, too funny. So the, the funny thing is, um for my for my friend's mm -hmm. movie trivia channel, I am deep in the hole. Um <laughs> I I wrote a coming of age match for him. 
Oh. And the entire time, we're like, this, this is the one where it's like, wait, of all the coming of age films, how have I not seen this? So I, said, yeah. I, I basically sat down, it's like, of everything else going on, like, I have no excuses. I have to watch it now. And I'm mm -hmm. so glad that I did. Oh, good. So good. And it just, I mean, I wish I could speak on it more, but it really has been years since I've seen it. I, I think I watched it my senior year of high school and I am now in my senior year of college. So it has been a hot minute and I don't have good memory, memory glands in my brain whatsoever. So I don't remember a single thing about this movie except for the music because I have it on my, all my Spotify playlists. Like I, I have the music from Dope. Um, and every time, every time it comes on, always a banger, always a double listen. You gotta go back, you gotta hear it again. Um, that's one thing that I loved about this movie just because I'm a very, as much as I love movie, I also love music a lot. Um, and that really got me because I love movies. If you didn't, couldn't tell by my Scott Pilgrim obsession, I love films that have their own original soundtrack. That I, like, I, I, yeah. Oh my God, the original music is so fucking good. Yeah. And th this, this sequence where it's playing over like all of the footage of the party and everything, yes. great. So, there was, I, yeah. I, I think I mentioned this during the Euphoria episode, if not, it applies there as well, where I think a, sh a shower movie is great when it makes me enjoy music that I generally don't like. like and this movie. music is so far out of yeah, all of my, all of my just, like enjoyment. Mm -hmm. We mentioned it earlier with, uh, with Blood Orange. Like, I don't really like rap or R&B. That's all yeah. there is. That's what this is. And it's fucking great. And I like it so much. Euphoria for that matter. <laughs> I, if I if I sat down and listened to all of the songs in the soundtrack, I generally wouldn't really like it. But in this show, it works perfectly. Even again, going back to our episode earlier, Billie Eilish's new like Spanish language song that she put for Jules's episode, oh. not a fan on its own. In the episode, fucking rocks. It's great. I didn't even know that was her. That's how much I know about Billie. Eilish. Now you like now you like a Billie Eilish song? I got you. No, yeah, no, I I don't I don't dislike Billie Eilish songs either. I just kind of am, am indifferent. Oh my goodness. No, that's amazing. That definitely, you've given me like two movies that I, one, need to go back and watch and another that I need to view for the first time. Plus the and Muppets. Muppets which oh like, fucking why not? Oh my God. You won, the, you won I, this episode for I'm sure. I'm slowly just becoming you is the issue. That is fair. Or you're becoming me one of the two. Either way. We're going, we're, we're going back and forth. I think we, we share, we share yeah. the... We're we're making a hive mind is what's happening. That is unfortunate. Yeah, that is what hap that is what's happening. Oh my goodness. Well, that was. I think those were two very good lists. I and think I did watch a lot more in, in my my winter break than I thought I did. So that is always fun to find out. You watch TV like you just you consumed like less individual, but you know, overall like maybe more content because like TV is just yeah. it's easier to binge movies but longer. Yeah, yeah kind of. Yeah. Sort of. Well, Thank you for watching Real Talk. Uh, fun episode. I missed this. I like that we're back. Next week's going to be a very fun episode. I'm possibly excited. depressing as well. We'll see. <laughs> and love and sin. If you're watching, we know you are. Uh, On our we're, reviewing, we're reviewing your new movie, Malcolm and Maria. M Marie. Uh, super excited yeah. to watch it. Show now. <laughs> no controversy whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> I... I look forward to watching it this Friday. I'm I will so have excited. tissues ready if I need I'm them. So psyched. It is gonna be fantastic. I just bought Zendaya's GQ cover and I am sad. I saw that on your Instagram or something. Oh my god. Oh my god. She looks fantastic. Oh my I god. Know. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, Malcolm and Marie next week. Um, I am so excited that we are back. This was very refreshing getting to talk to you because I miss this. I miss our movie conversations. And we hope that you all missed our conversations as well. And if you would like to get in on the conversation, we have social media. Real Talk PTB. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Real Talk. Real is or Real Talk PTB. Real is spelled R-E-E-L. Uh, if you haven't caught on, that's the funny joke about this podcast. Um, so uh, hit us up on those, um, our socials, and we will chat with you about movie. Um, about movie, just one. Just one. one. You can and, only and talk about one movie. Nothing else. And it is Muppets Most Wanted. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> we pick one movie a week, and you can only talk about that movie on that week. Don't if try not, and bring it the next week. You're you banned. <laughs> <laughs> if not, you get blocked immediately. Immediately. <laughs> Instantly. Oh, my goodness. Oh, it's good to be back. Well, thank you all for listening. What's the outro that we normally say? I forget it now. <laughs> it's all you, but like, you're the one who does it. It's good uh, night and good movies, right? 
I like that one better. I just stole the Truman Show. Anyway. That's what is, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you for watching Real Talk. Again, we'll be back next week uh, talking about a great movie that may, we'll either cry or hate. Maybe both. We'll see. Cry or hate? How could we hate it? Uh, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Anyways, thank you guys. Um, for <laughs> thank you for watching. We will see you next week. If we don't see you before then, good afternoon, good evening.